Hi, my name is Ed. I'm a faculty member at John Abbott College. I'm the person who videoed this presentation and made this video series. So let me introduce things before we begin. This is the second series of videos showing the talks of Oliver Hillel, Program Secretary from the United Nations Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD. The first series from about a year ago is already on this YouTube channel. These talks are eminently suitable for educational use as well as for personal information. What underlies the current drive for sustainability is the need to preserve biodiversity in the environment. Mr. Hillel has returned to talk about biodiversity, this time from a more personal and motivational perspective, which you'll hear after the first 10 minutes or more of this series. This presentation on September 23, 2010 at St. Anne de Belle, Quebec on the island of Montreal is on a campus shared by John Abbott College and the McDonald campus of McGill University. As with last year's series, the presentation was organized by Doris Miller, whose affiliate organization to the Secretariat is Nature Connection and who is currently Environmental Studies Coordinator at John Abbott. The talk was given on behalf of the College Sustainability Committee. It's a pleasure to be here again. I think uh, last uh, occasion I was here at John Abbott, it was uh, such a productive discussion. And I think uh, it actually helps us, or particularly me in this case, because it gives us a sense of meaning of what we do and what we work, because sometimes it can be lost. And I'll tell you more about that. So, uh, first of all, thank you to, to all of you. And I think uh, this is the first time that we have uh, with us people from the high school, as well as from the CIGEP, and as well as faculty from the university, from the guild. And I think that's uh, to be celebrated. And it's also, for me, uh, one of the objectives I have here today is to see how we can think together and how, how to use this unique combination of strengths of having all the educational process. Because um, what Doris challenged me to talk about to you today is uh, biodiversity management after 2010. What can education do, or in particular, what can we, both as students and faculty, uh, what can we do about that? And I think uh, this is a challenge for both sides, obviously. So the first thing uh, I wanted to say is that I think it would be, for me, a different way to approach that, but instead of telling you a lot about data and facts, I would like to share with you more the conclusions and more, and as we go into conclusions, obviously, that means those are personal thoughts. And what I'd like to do is to take about, um, it's now 12.15, take about 25 minutes if you allow me to show you what I'm thinking, and then definitely go into a few questions and answers with you. Uh, so the idea is to not talk, you know, not dump statistics on you, but tell you what actually I feel about those issues and, and what I think uh, we learn in our day-to-day -day work in the convention. And uh, of course, we want to talk about biodiversity, but then what is biodiversity for many of you? I will not have looked at last year's talk, I don't want to repeat anything, but uh, biodiversity, the concept of biodiversity includes all diversity of life on Earth. Um, we have, at the moment, if, if we want statistics, we have described as uh, the group of scientists all across the world who describe something like 2.5 to 3 million living species. But most of them, of course, are bigger because when you go to the smaller creatures, it's very difficult to start describing those. So nobody has a clue how many of those species exist. It could be anything between 15 to 30 million species all around. And that's what biodiversity is around. But also, I'm going to talk here as natural capital, meaning what does it mean to us, all that biodiversity? Right? It's, it's just not the living beings, but what they mean in relation to us. And also, I think, um, for me, one of the most fascinating things in looking at biodiversity as, as all the group of living things is the incredible complexity of that and how incredible... It, it's just fascinating. It's a sense of wonder on looking at all those forms of life that I think uh, is part of other values of biodiversity that I also wanted to share with you today. Interestingly enough, when we talk about the United Nations, biodiversity was seen as a concept that comes from the North. And I'm not familiar if you know that in the UN we talk about North meaning developed countries and South meaning developing countries, 
poorer countries or small and in developing countries and so on. So in the beginning of the discussion when the convention was signed in 93, many countries, including my own country, Brazil, were somehow a bit concerned about it because they said, you know, for many other people, biodiversity as just the group of living beings doesn't make a lot of sense. And people were talking at that time about conservation of biodiversity. And, and we will talk about that. So conservation of biodiversity was to protect the animals and the plants because they were disappearing so quickly. But that is definitely a developed country way of looking at biodiversity because when you actually feed on biodiversity, when you live with biodiversity on a day-to-day -day basis, which many of us actually don't that much, there is no sense of talking about biodiversity outside of your needs, and there is certainly no need to talk about conservation of biodiversity. You live off it, you need to use it. You are poor, you need to, to you need the, the food. So, you know, this whole idea of conservation of biodiversity was definitely seen as an issue for the North. In 92, in Rio, basically, Brazil and many other countries told the North, you cannot tell us not to destroy nature because you've done it already and you've become rich in this process. So for us now, we can't just do exactly the same. We still have to use biodiversity as a tool for development. So there was this whole evolution of biodiversity from conservation, which is the first objective of the convention, to the second one, which is sustainable use which means basically keeping it there, but, you know, the sustainable yield of all the benefits from biodiversity, but you have to, you need it. That's not only conservation. And now, what is called access and benefit sharing, which means who gets the money from biodiversity? Because I said that the last time, it still applies. The Convention on Biological Diversity, with all those millions of species of plants and animals, it's all about power and it's all about money. So this is why this evolution becomes so important. And, and, and it is that the, the background to which I wanted to, to tell you all that. And this horrible slide is here to shock you into understanding that I'm talking from the point of view of the United Nations. What you see here before you is a simplified organogram of the United Nations. Remember yesterday I, I was listening to the news and I heard that Stephen Harper was talking at the United Nations. And the comment from the, from the journalist was that Stephen Harper doesn't actually often talk in the United Nations because he feels it's a bloated bureaucracy. That is uh, news yesterday. I have to agree. That's one of the few occasions I should say in which I totally agree with him. <laughs> but I feel, that regarding the United Nations, I feel it's the only way for global, for a limited measure of global governance. We don't have any other. I feel like when I was a student and I had that old Volkswagen Beetle. It wasn't the best car I could have, but it was the only one I could have, so I should make it work because there's no other option. And I think about the United Nations when we talk about all the difficulties in the Convention on Biological Diversity here. I think the point I want to make is it's still the same. We have to make it work because as far as I understand, there is not much more. So I was very happy to hear that Mr. Harper went to the United Nations, and particularly with that particular message that he sent that is, we need more money to combat poverty, which of course makes a lot of sense. But the point I want to make here as well is that when we look at that biodiversity right now, I can't give you any good news. It is really very, very threatening. And here is just a few, I mean, it's, it's, it's really serious. And this, this slide is here because I want to try to share with you, and, and we have other colleagues here from the Secretariat, why we are so passionate about what we do. Why, why do we think this is really important? First of all, it's going. It's going. 80% of the Caribbean coral reef is either bleached or suffering. 80%, 80%. So the situation is not easy, and that needs food and livelihood for those people as well as tourists. Fisheries, same, same percentage of rice. Eighty percent of all stock of fish on Earth is either fished to the brim or overfished. Imagine that. We nowadays, when we all eat sushi, great, but tuna, it's gone. So this, this is really applying to our everyday life. Forests. Three big forests in the world still standing. One is in Borneo, one is in the Amazon, and, and uh, the other is in Central Africa. Other than that, we don't have many. We, 
forested areas. Yes, we do in the temperate regions, and thankfully, while the tropicals are going away, many of the temperate forests in the world are actually recovering because of changes in the way developed countries do agriculture. However, where is the biodiversity? It's not in the temperate forest, it's in the tropical rainforest. So as we see that tropical forest disappearing, we need to take care because that's where most of that biodiversity lives. Okay, there is a scientific fact nowadays, and, and I, I shared that with you the last time. If the trend for disappearance, which is now about 150 species per day, those are estimates because nobody even knows that's the fact. Remember, we have described 2 million species and there might be as much as 30 million. So 90% of the biodiversity, we have no clue. Right? So when we, we're talking about rates of extinction 100 to a 10 pound, uh, to a thousand times faster, and when we talk about the fact that in 2030 we could have 75% of all species that we knew in the beginning before the Industrial Revolution gone. And, and that compares to extinction events in the, in the past where huge meteors or where climate change caused a disappearance of up to 95% of the life on Earth. In, in geological time, very often, we were this close to this disappearance. And we are now going not to 95, but 75. Hey, that's pretty trouble. And so the situation is dire. There is no denying that. And what I think is also important here is to understand that food, there is nothing we eat but biodiversity. We cannot eat anything that is out of biodiversity. Imagine that. So no amount of, of, of money will create food if there's no diversity of food. And, and in this sense, just a, a fact, in, in 1500, when Brazil was being discovered, and, and when you know the big commercial revolution was happening all over, we ate, as a humanity, we ate about 200 kinds of plants and animals. Uh, particularly on, uh, on, sorry, 200 plants, 200 plants, and today we eat about 25. So we have stopped uh, eating in a diverse way. And of course we all know that fresh water you can have, in, in a city you can have fresh water from two sources, from nature, and that costs very, very little. Or you may have to produce that fresh water from your polluted water, you will pay duty for that. So using watersheds as a way of nature, and biodiversity, just as a, a way to clean water, is a way to save billions and billions of dollars globally every year. 50% of all big cities in the world are feeding directly from rivers and from sources. So this 50% they're using those services of biodiversity. The others are paying through their nose to clean water in a way that doesn't really get clean because if you put aluminum sulfate in water, you know, and then take it off and all those treatments, the result can't be too good. Health and medicine. There's a stat statistic that says that 25% of all medication is all the all everything we take comes from nature. I think that's false. It's 100 percent because there's not a single artificial compound in medicine that is not tested on biodiversity and that is not it's, it comes from biodiversity. You know, nowadays you take an aspirin, but that came from a tree. Nowadays it's done synthetically, but it is absolutely linked. And a lot of the the, the, the threats to our health that we have come not from from uh, just the germs, this whole idea that I'm going to be infected by uh, some kind of bacteria and then become sick, it's changing a little bit. What we see is that we have a balance inside of us. About a fifth of our weight is not human, did you know that? So we are a living community ourselves. So when that balance of that community within us, of the bacteria in our gut and others, when that gets out of balance, that's when we become sick. So in a way, the, the, the idea of balance is linked to medicine as well as it is to biodiversity. End of part one of three of the second series of talks on biodiversity at John Abbott College by Oliver Hillel, Program Officer of the Secretariat of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Two more parts follow this. Please go on to part two.